His name meant the Man of Steel, making him the original Superman. If Superman fought for the Legion of Doom instead of the Justice League, he helped spur the revolution against Russia's czarist dictators, championing the cause of the common man. His dream was to create a state where everybody had access to the means of production, and companies shared equitably with their employees, instead of exploiting their labor for themselves. Yet, somewhere along the line, Stalin's young idealistic thoughts darkened, and he launched the Soviet Union into decades of tyranny, in many ways worse than what the Tsars had ever brought to the Russian people. Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin needs little introduction. He ruled the Soviet Union as dictator from 1922 until 1953, arising to the post of General Secretary shortly after the death of Vladimir Lenin. Both men had initially championed the views of Karl Marx, German communist philosopher who yearned for a system in which the common man was treated fairly by the runaway capitalist powers of his day. Early in the revolution, both Lenin and Stalin espoused these values and sought to build an equitable communist state. However, very quickly, the political reality of their revolution saw both men begin to betray the values of Marx, twisting communism into a means for seizing and holding on to power for themselves. Stalin, however, would be the one to ultimately destroy Russia's chance at true communism and pervert the ideals of Marx to the rest of the world, recognizing that he would be an unchecked dictator if allowed to seize power. On his deathbed, Lenin warned the Communist Party about Stalin's ambitions and did not endorse him for leadership after his death. Stalin was a shrewd politician, though, and had worked to play his enemies against themselves, fading into the background of conflicts he started, only to materialize as the solution toward the end of the conflict. Upon Lenin's death, he opposed Leon Trotsky's ideals of exporting the workers' revolution abroad and instead focusing on the Soviet Union alone. Soon, all the power in the Soviet Union centered around him, and he established himself as dictator for life. To understand Stalin's evil, you have to understand the Soviet Revolution itself. First though, it's important to know the difference between Stalinism and Communism. Often and mostly because people don't like to read books, the world is viewed as Communism versus Democracy, as if the two were completely opposite entities on either end of the political spectrum. Democracy means liberty for the individual while Communism means mindless servitude. Yet this comparison couldn't possibly be more wrong. And that's chiefly because the entire idea of communism was developed by Marx as a means of saving democracy. After the French Revolution, a growing socialist movement grew concerned that runaway capitalism would completely undermine a democracy. It was feared that the concentration of wealth amongst the rich elite would allow them to wield considerably more influence than the common man in a democratic system, and in essence, make their votes exponentially more powerful. Fast forward to modern America where in the 21st century the concept of super PACs was approved of by the American Congress, allowing undisclosed individuals and even corporations to funnel money without revealing their identities to any politician's election campaign that they favored. The influx of hundreds of millions of dollars, all of it completely undisclosed, is used to run political ads and events which then directly influence voters nationally. Grassroots nominees relying on funding from the voter base can't hope to match such massive amounts of money and are routinely run underfoot by super PAC campaigns. In essence, communism was meant to save democracy from the concept of the super PAC in 19th century Europe. To protect the wealthy elite from running democracy as they saw fit, Marx envisioned a system of workers' rights, many of which have been since implemented around the world and you enjoy today. That's right, comrade, turns out you're already a communist. However, Marx also argued that individuals needed to share in the success of the business that employed them through equitable profit sharing, empowering the worker, granting him access to education, and preventing the rich elite from using their massive resources to influence democracy and being able to recall public officials when they failed at their jobs was Marx's idea of communism. For Russian citizens living under the brutality of the Tsars, a fair and equitable democratic state brought about through communism seemed like a dream, and Lenin and Stalin both seized their desire. Unfortunately, where Marx wanted to empower the worker, Stalin used the worker to empower himself. He nationalized many elements of the economy under the guise of making the entire system equitable for all. The truth, however, was that this allowed him to seize absolute control over his nation, and completely unsurprisingly, this led to him enriching himself and the political elite around him considerably, while workers saw no benefit. Wonder if that sounds familiar to modern viewers.
In the end, Stalin did not create a communist state meant to lead directly to a restored and strong democracy. Rather, Stalin perverted the communist revolution in order to create a Stalinist state, and millions of Westerners who never bothered to read a book on the subject would forevermore complain about communism without realizing that its ultimate goal was always democracy. To seize power, Stalin brutalized the Soviet state and its citizens, and his brutality persisted long after he was in power. Knowing how easily revolution could spread throughout Russia, a people with very little love for dictators, and knowing that he had corrupted the communist revolution and could be targeted for removal, Stalin worked very hard to ensure that revolution never happened. Mostly he did this by killing people, a whole lot of people. One of Stalin's first targets were what he deemed the intelligentsia, or intellectual elites in the new Soviet Union. Almost from the start of his reign, the Soviet Union's intellectuals immediately began to call BS on Stalin and tried to warn the people that their pro-democratic revolution had been totally co-opted and that there was nothing democratic about the system Stalin was building. In a bid to defend his action, Stalin gathered the nation's leading minds and artists together for a public debate that could be attended by anyone, with the average person free to make up their mind about who was right. <laughs> Just kidding. Stalin had around 2,000 intellectuals summarily gathered up and sent straight to brutal prisons deep in the Soviet Arctic. These gulags originally housed political prisoners from the Tsarist age, but very quickly filled up with just about anyone smart enough to say, hey, maybe this Stalin dude isn't really all that interested in a free democracy after all. Over 1,500 of them would end up dying in the camps, and much more of the rest quickly fled from the Soviet Union. During World War II, the gulags were once more filled to capacity with all manner of intellectuals who failed the state somehow. Anyone who couldn't maintain Stalin's unrealistic schedules for production, or who made for convenient scapegoats for Germany's victories and its invasions, all were rounded up and sent to the camps. Speaking of these camps, while they were touted as political re-education camps, much like China's current camps in the weaker region of China, in reality they were nothing more than slave labor camps. The first people Stalin sent to these camps were criminals and wealthy farmers known as kulaks. The kulaks had staged several armed rebellions against Stalin's policy of collectivization, where they lost all control of their farms and were forced to join massive collectives controlled by the government something Marx definitely wouldn't have approved of. Soon though, Stalin figured out that sending political opponents to Siberia was a really convenient way of silencing them, especially because the massive amounts of murders he was committing threatened to raise public anger against him. The camps would grow to a population of 5 million, and were used to produce many goods to be sold throughout the Soviet Union. In some camps, men and women were housed in different units, while in other camps they were housed together. Dozens of people would share a single large housing unit, which was poorly built and not heated. Forced to huddle in thin blankets against the bitter Russian cold, rations were meager and most died from the forced labor. Women were forced into prison marriages with strong male prisoners in order to avoid being raped, though rape of women by other prisoners and even guards was commonplace even with these prison marriages in place. Political opponents and the intellectuals weren't Stalin's only threats though, and for two years Stalin initiated what would be known as the Great Purge. Running from 1936 to 1938, Stalin looked at the Red Army for enemies, and he had a great reason for doing so. The Red Army was the creation of Leon Trotsky, his chief political opponent after the death of Lenin, and most of its officers were loyal to him and Trotsky's views in establishing a truly democratic Soviet state. Stalin immediately took to imprisoning and killing every military officer he deemed suspicious, even many who had no particular allegiance to Trotsky. In the end, Stalin would kill or imprison three out of five of his marshals, eight out of nine of his admirals, 13 out of 15 army commanders, 50 out of 57 corps commanders, all of his army commissars, and 25 out of 28 of his corps commissars. Similar figures followed at every rank amongst the rest of the Red Army's officer corps, leading to thousands of murders and imprisonments. The purge would ultimately be a giant disaster for Stalin though. The men that Stalin had removed from their posts were seasoned combat veterans and well-trained military officers. They were replaced by inexperienced officers and complete toadies, whose only qualification to lead troops was their blind devotion to Stalin. When the Soviet Union went to war against Finland, a nation so small that the world assumed the massive Red Army would overrun it in weeks, the war dragged on for months, and the Soviets suffered 
massive casualties. In the end, this proved to the world that the Red Army was a giant lumbering behemoth with no real strength, and it emboldened Hitler to attack the Soviet Union shortly after. In the end, it was sheer numbers, a complete disregard for casualties, and billions of dollars worth of military aid by the United States that saw the Soviet Union defeat Nazi Germany's invasion. Trotsky himself would be a final victim of Stalin's Great Purge, though, killed in his home in Mexico City in 1940. After fleeing the Soviet Union due to a gang of machine gunners riddling his home with bullets, Trotsky settled in Mexico City, hoping he was finally far enough away from Stalin. Stalin, however, was famous for his relentless brutality and literally went to the ends of the earth to see his enemies crushed. A young Spanish man working for Stalin's secret police befriended Trotsky, and the latter invited him to his home for tea. While visitors were routinely searched by the security given to Trotsky, the young man wasn't searched as he'd been personally invited by Trotsky. The man immediately produced a small pickaxe he'd kept hidden in his pants and fractured Trotsky's skull. Even with the help of surgeons flown in from the United States, Trotsky died of his injuries, his last words to a bodyguard being, I think Stalin finished the job he started. Stalin's crimes against humanity were many, from artificial famines that killed millions meant to quell rebellions in Ukraine, to the murder and imprisonment of millions of his own people. Stalin would go to any length in order to ensure his grip on the Soviet Union. In the end, his greatest crime, however, may have been the coercion of the communist revolution meant to bring about a free democracy to the Soviet people. This not only denied democracy to Russians for decades, but directly led to the bitter enmity between the Soviet Union and the United States, and the host of proxy wars that took place between the two. In essence, Stalin managed to export his brutality and violence around the world, ensuring that tens of millions of innocents from China to South America would be caught up in the struggle between Stalin's version of communism and democracy. A fact sadly made more ironic because communism was always meant to bring about democracy. Now that you've sat through some of the brutality of one of history's most evil men, why not check out something a bit more fun instead by clicking this video over here, or maybe you'd rather check out this one instead. Either way, you can't lose, so click now.